I apologize in advance if you hate the sound of like a nasally sort of uh, raspy voice because I have been sick for the past five days because I can't take any medications because I'm pregnant. It's been so much worse and I feel like my healing process has been much longer because I've been healing from a lot of things externally from the actual sickness so like stress and being overwhelmed and having a, a huge workload, moving country, not being with my cat and being pregnant at the same time. But now the sun is shining. I wanted to do a video. I've actually been wanting to do this video for ages, but I feel like I haven't had the mental capacity or the headspace to sit down and talk about something because I have been brain dead. I do get pregnancy brain where it's like, you kind of feel like foggy. I don't have as much quickness as I usually do, my vocabulary isn't that good and my articulation isn't as good as it usually is but as long as the information is there I need to stop worrying about it. I put it on my story and ask people to ask me questions because it makes it makes it easier to format the video a bit better because otherwise I'll go off on a tangent like talk shite. Who wants to see my belly? <laughs> oh my god. You can't really see it. I wake up around 7 a.m. naturally every morning anyway but I was so excited to get out into the garden I didn't even change my underwear from yesterday and I know that's really bad. If I'm still getting my hole, that's all I care about. Anyway, has being pregnant changed your sex life or intimacy? Or do you think the process of having a baby will? Is how I'm going to get into the sponsor of today's video. They've sponsored me before. It's Beducated. It's essentially YouTube, but for your sex life. I've done their course on a roadmap of intimacy, which is where I got the information and the idea for this video. It is actually the best course that I've ever done on their website. So I really recommend it to everyone. Did half of it. And then I texted Jason and I was like, I think we should do this, the rest of this together because because it's gonna really invigorate our relationship. I think we could both benefit from it. The thing with the Beducated as well, it's not just about solely about sex. It's the building blocks that builds up to a relationship and being in, like physically intimate with each other. The foundations and the fundamentals of physical intimacy cannot be built without emotional intimacy. To understand emotional in intimacy, you have to understand yourself and you have to understand your partner. So that's why I really recommend doing it together. And if your partner doesn't have the time to do it with you, that you do it and you relate the information back to them. The course, what I really like about it is that it's very interactive. It offers you exercises to try with your partner or you can try them alone. But the most fun one is to, is to create goals for your future together. So what sacrifices you're, you're going to have to make for your other partner, what things that you're most excited to to do together and it's not something that you would discuss on a day-to-day -day basis anyway because it's more like your day-to-day -day things that you're talking about and not like who do you want to be in five years and how can I help you achieve that who do we as a couple want to be in five years and how can we achieve that together the more you work on your emotional intimacy together the more that you can be vulnerable with each other and the more vulnerable you can be in your emotional relationship and speaking to each other and communicating about every aspect of your relationship together the easier it is I think it is to be in vulnerable in the bedroom or or like when, when you're having sex with each other. A lot of these questions relate to how do I be more comfortable naked around my partner? How can I communicate for what I want? And how can I make them feel more comfortable? And a lot of that, it's not so straightforward. It's not like just speak better when you're together. Just be naked more around them. It actually comes from being able to communicate to begin with in your emotional relationship, how vulnerable you can be with each other and how welcoming you can make your partner feel so that they feel comfortable being vulnerable with you as well. You can be creative the problem just as much as they are because the human body is so disgusting it is so beautiful but it is also so disgusting and me and Jason have discussed every part of like what would you do if this if like my arms were to fall off what would you do if the, you know what I mean would you still love me if you know that you kind of ask those as a joke but I'm like you're half being serious as well because anything can happen at any moment the only thing Jason has no tolerance for is varicose veins so I'm prepared that if I do get a varicose vein, I will have to get it removed, which is fair enough because they are repulsive. So sorry if anyone has a varicose, varicose vein, but he was just like, if you have a varicose vein, I will actually feel, I will feel sick to my stomach that I won't be able to look at you. But you could probably have sex without looking at a varicose vein because they're usually in your legs anyway. Fair enough, it's not just like they're repulsed by you, it's just something that happens with bodies. Like I couldn't, I have literally had Jason look in my asshole multiple times because I feel like something's in there. <laughs> I feel like there's a rash, maybe I have a spot, which I have never been able to do with any other of my partners before. And it's not that he's showing me his asshole, so he's like, open up to me, baby. I don't know if it came from age, if I'm just like, fuck it, I don't care anymore. And there's no way to tell, because it could be a myriad of things, but I do believe it's because he makes me feel so comfortable, but I'm also 
have the capabilities of making him feel really comfortable around me too. So we're able to like fart in front of each other and not feel like, oh, they're going to fall out of love with me because I'm, you know, they can hear me having taking a shot. Being pregnant has made me embrace my body and everything that's so disgusting with it and but also the wonders of your body like I can literally grow a human inside me I'm gaining weight at an exponential rate it is really uncomfortable that's the only thing but I've never felt more beautiful and more confident in my skin because it's working the way it should it's functioning properly I would be worried if I wasn't gaining weight you know five years ago I would have been so worried at gaining weight that I wasn't fitting into my trousers anymore and it was all going to my stomach because that's not the beauty standard my anatomy is built to bear a child so it's safe for weight to gain around my stomach area to protect said fetus that is inside me. The course talks a lot about how to be safe and vulnerable to like build just a strong connection with each other and how to move forward with that and it, it really improves your sex life. I'm not going to talk about everything on the course because I do think that everyone should do it and I'm not an, I'm also not an expert. The two of the people teaching the course are complete experts. They're also married. Um, it is from a heterosexual perspective but they do talk about like different genders and different relationships status types. But my favourite part of the course is actually at the very beginning. It talks about how one person in the relationship is a sail and one person is an anchor. The person who's the anchor is like grounded, calm, stable, consistent and keeps the relationship at a steady base. Whereas the sail is very action or orientated. It takes the relationship to the next level. I would say I'm more the sail and Jason's the anchor because he'll sip, like he'll ask me how I'm feeling. Whereas like I can't, I find it really hard to like sit down and talk about our feelings. If there's two anchors in a relationship it can com become stale and rigid and kind of boring or stagnant where it's not getting brought to the next level but if there are two sails it can crash into the rocks so it could be very dramatic and all over the place the representation I can think of two sails is like breaking up and getting back together all the time two anchors is like doing the same thing over and over and over again like you are in a relationship and it is safe and steady but it is you're both like progressively getting more bored and it gets harder and harder to sp spice things up it differs from depending on the pregnancy I'd say. For me personally I have found that everything is more sensitive down there, it's m way more lubricated. Uh, obviously because my emotions are intensified too, my love for him is more intensified so when we're having sex it's not, um, I don't think it's a bad thing either. Sex can be really transactional in a relationship especially when you've been together for a long time or if you live together. It's like let's have a quickie so we can, because we're both horny you know and you're not really embracing each other presence you're not like basking in their love being intimate with each other and being really present you're just like let's get this over and done with even if it is some con subconscious and it's both consented by both partners in the re in the action of sexing it up sometimes you do need a quickie like it needs to be done in a public bathroom or whatever so that you do need to get it over and done with very fast If you want to intensify your relationship, you want to improve your sex life and you want to improve your emotional intimacy, being pregnant has really helped me do that because I've just been enjoying it a lot more. I've become a lot more willing to communicate what I want to. Well, the baby is Leo and I'm convinced it's like changing my whole personality because the baby is controlling my body. I'm like possessed by this Leo baby. But I think a lot of the times there has been an attachment with like crazy sex, mean meaning good sex, when necessarily that's not the case. Most of the time it actually isn't at all. Most people like vanilla sex, but it's like the components of that, van what it goes into that vanilla sex. You need to feel safe. You need to feel like there's enough foreplay. So so it can slide right in there. You need to also stay within your routines because I know a lot of couples have routines. It's like you, you touch me here, they touch you there and then you start having sex and it's the same every single time. So there is an element of like staying within that and also colouring outside the lines sometimes. And I found that pregnancy has just helped me do that a lot more because I have been so... My sex drive is way higher. It will be interesting to see how different it gets when I get bigger because it's not like because with normal straightforward fat my belly would be it's something to grab onto and it's kind of a cushion and nice and warm the way your boobs are you know it's like something to grab onto it's a nice whereas my tummy it's like a sensitive area 
and it's also rock hard so it's not really that sex it doesn't feel sexy I'm interested to see what it's gonna be like when I'm really heavy I'll probably have a whole separate video postpartum essentially you're not supposed to have sex six weeks after postpartum because your uterus is an open wound and it has to heal so if any bacteria or anything gets up there it can get infected so nothing should go like no fingers nothing like there shouldn't be any action up there but I doubt that I'm gonna want anything you're gonna be so tired I'm gonna smell like stale breast milk I can just imagine what it's going to be like anyway and I'm not expecting it to be easy but I also trust in me and Jason's relationship that we'll figure it out whatever the fuck happens a lot of relationships like don't have start having sex again until a year postpartum it's just how you can keep up with the needs of your partner and the needs of yourself it's something I'll decide we'll decide between each other but I am kind of scared like I do have to push a human out of my vagina my mom didn't tear for any of her four kids so I'm hoping that I inherit whatever that super gene is super stretchy vagina gene I'm fearful because Jason has a humongous head and if the baby has inherited his head but we'll see there's no way to know I'll probably update you and it will be next August or September. How many times do couples usually have sex a week? I'm feeling insecure because my boy boyfriend wants to have sex less than me. So I have a video about this. I, it's called Sex, Shame and Blowjobs. I go into more detail about having a different uh, libido. Maybe it is that one. I'll link all my other sex videos down below where I'm talking about giving relationship advice and they're all sponsored by Beducated as well because they're really good. But I do talk about having different uh, libidos but the most important thing is to not feel shameful. It has, most of the time, there's two ends of the spectrum. It's either they're not attracted to you which is usually what your mind runs to because it's the easiest thing to think of if your partner isn't like engaging with you sexually it's the first thing that you jump to that they're not attracted to you or they don't love you anymore where most of the time it's just because you have differentiating libidos and there's nothing really you can do to help that as a person there's something they can improve themselves if they're willing but it's not something that you can pressure them into because they're within the right to keep it at that you might feel apprehensive to talk about something like that because it does feel unnatural to like ask why your partner doesn't want to have sex with you but most of the time if they are honest about it it's not going to be anything to do with you it could be to do with their diet it could be to do how they view themselves sexually how comfortable they are in their own skin so just don't get yourself worked up over it it's nothing to do with you usually someone said i feel my sensitivity has faded down there it's such a weird feeling any advice this has actually happened to me a few times and i was so paranoid that it was my sex it was because of my sex toys but i was just paranoid that i was like damaging nerves down there from like my vibrator but I don't think that's actually true because it's like back again usually what the issue is there's some disconnect with yourself and your body or your sorry some disconnect between your mind and your body so what I'd have to do is acknowledge what the problem is or find out what the problem is it's usually to do with stress worried about something it, and it's totally unrelated to my body or sex so yeah do things like yoga meditate exercise try be in stillness and try do something where you're just alone with your thoughts it's just about like getting in more in tune with your body so that you can actually feel everything a body scan is really good to do that if it's something that it's like hindering your relationship a little bit I would communicate that with your partner because like the question before they can jump to oh they're, they don't love me anymore they're not attracted to me like if they're finding it hard for you to engage because if you're not feeling anything down there you're not gonna really want to have sex um, unless you just wanna pleasure your partner, but then that's fine. But if you're not really feeling anything, like don't force yourself to do it because you're just gonna make the situation worse. It's something that you do have to figure out yourself. I would try doing a body scan meditation, writing down your worries, try getting enough sleep. Sleep can be can affect that too. Alcohol, drugs, you go through a dry spell, so maybe don't have sex. Like a dry spell for me is probably like a week or like a week and a half of not having sex. And then after that, you'll find that the sensitivity comes back and you'll realize that it wasn't something to do with your actual physical body. It was probably something to do with your mind. Yeah, someone said, my boyfriend has loads of previous sex partners. How do I not feel so insignificant? Which is really interesting to me because I've always had more sexual partners than my ex, my part, my boyfriends. And I've always felt shit about myself. So on the other end of the spectrum, it's like if a woman has more sexual partners than a man in a heterosexual relationship you feel inadequate or like ruined and then if their partner if your boyfriend has more sexual partners than you you feel insignificant or like not trained enough let me tell you this having sex with more people doesn't mean that is like 
you're better at sex or more experienced in any way. You can have sex with random people, not at random people, but more people, and the experience is absolutely terrible, and it's like the worst sex of your life. The only positive I think that would come from that is, I've been with people enough to know that Jason is my perfect person. There's going to be no way of me being like, oh, I wonder what sex is that this person is going to be like. I'm not wondering about that because I know that it never lives, lives up to your expectations. It's always so much better building up a sexual relationship with someone that you trust and you love because you're more willing to experiment things and you know what each other like and you can communicate more depending on your communication style if it's good or not in your relationship so i prefer sex like in a committed relationship than i do outside of that the more people you have sex with it's usually from not in relationships if that reassures you coming from someone who has more sexual partners i prefer sex in a committed relationship and i think most people do yeah they're never as good as you think how do you get over the feeling of your parents' relationship impacting yours? Yeah, at some stage you have to kind of take personal responsibility at how much you're going to let other people's relationships affect you, especially your past relationships. I was big into justifying my bad behaviors from my abusive relationship, and obviously to a certain extent that is not my fault. It's, it was my survival instinct to behave in that way. But after a while, and once you start actually realizing your behaviors and understanding your patterns, but still choosing not to change, I think then it's an issue within yourself and and something that you have to change within yourself. For example, after I was in my abusive relationship, my next boyfriend became sort of like an emotional punching bag, whereas I thought that because we weren't fighting, he didn't love me, and I thought that drama equated to passion. If we weren't, if we didn't have any drama, he wasn't passionate about me and he didn't love me enough, so I was always creating problems in my head. Which, interestingly enough, the f when I went for a therapy session, they were like, oh, maybe you have borderline. And I'm like, can you just not, start, can you not um, try to diagnose me with something? please I had probably had pier facial piercings and colored hair at the time and they were like she has borderline you know what I mean it's like I don't think it's that simple to be honest stop handing out the diagnosis I think to a certain extent you have to realize how much is from learned behaviors and how much are you like letting yourself away with because you're like oh this is just what I'm like now my parents were like that so that's what I'm like if you're able to acknowledge that you have the ability to change that obviously my parents are divorced uh, but they got divorced after 25 years it's so it's really like I remember them being together and being happy and I remember them falling apart and it happening out of nowhere so a lot of times and it was true I was a teenager very bad timing so I think that did impact me a lot whereas I saw what happened to my mom and the way I perceived it was I was fearful of that happening to me so then I craved validation and this is only like I probably only healed that part of myself and not even fully it's always probably going to be there a little bit but I have dealt with that probably until I was about 22 like I only kind of dealt with the, that part of myself during first lockdown the way I got through it was it was because I realized from my past relationship like that relationship that I'd just gone out of how much shit I let myself go through because I just wanted to be with someone and I wanted to be loved and accepted by someone but in the end I was accepting so much bullshit and so much hurt and pain that I wasn't being loved at all and I ended up feeling lonelier in that relationship than uh, I would have been if I was out of it after that, uh, and I think I just needed all that time to think and be alone with myself and be in pain to realize how much I do deserve and um, now I'm like with my soulmate. So, and I don't like tolerate shit anymore. I'm able to communicate. And I'm able to have fights without being afraid. I'm able to speak up when something's wrong and not just keep it to myself because I'm scared of them leaving me. A small part of me, which is also, I think, a survival instinct a small part of me subconsciously is expecting for Jason to leave me or cheat on me or leave me for someone else but it's not in the way where I'm living my life knowing that to be true or believing that to be true where I'm like treating him like shit or like there's no point in trying this relationship because you're eventually going to leave me I'm not living in the way I know it's in the back of my mind there but I'm able to compartmentalize that put it in a drawer and put it away where it's like I can use that to my advantage where I am prepared slightly if that were to ever happen by chance and I can know how I would react in that situation and how could we because especially I think it's because a child's on the way it's like how can we cope parent then after that and repair our relationship as friends um so that we can still be in each other's lives because sometimes shit does happen people do fall out of love and it could be like 30 years down the line but at least i know how i would want myself to react obviously we can't predict how we're going to react either especially if you're coming from a place of pain a reactive pain most likely i'll just like blow up and fall off the face of the earth but hopefully i would hope for the sake of my children that i would 
behave in a mature and pra pragmatic way where I can be detached from, still obviously allow myself to be hurt and in pain. Jesus, this is a bit depressing. I'm like, what would I do if Jason left me? How do you not feel guilty after sleeping with someone even though everything went well? Again, I have a video on shame, in my sex shame and blowjobs video. Girls and, girls and women in particular suffer a lot from this. I did so much in my first relationship and any time I was having casual sex to sort of receive validation or heal myself, I would feel ashamed. I would feel ashamed almost immediately after. From the abusive relationship, obviously it was because I, di I, didn't, feel uns I didn't feel safe in that relationship and I felt bad for either having an orgasm or enjoying myself because I knew I was in a bad situation and I shouldn't have been with him. I also felt very guilty for like leaving that precedent or example for my sisters. So I just felt guilty every time after we had sex and a lot of times it like wasn't consented and wasn't nice. So that's like the extreme end of things of why I felt ashamed after we had sex. And then for the casual sex one, it was just that I wasn't comfortable. I wasn't actually having the sex because I wanted to have sex. It was just because I wanted them to feel better or validate me or tell me. It was like telling me that I'm worth having sex with. Now I don't feel shame as much anymore because I know that I'm actually wanted within myself for my own reasons and I want my partner to enjoy it as much as me. It's probably stemming from some, from some other issue that you have. You could feel ashamed of your body yourself. It could be like a societal thing where women aren't supposed to enjoy sex, but I can't, it's too broad. I can't um, speak on behalf, but if you do watch my sex shame blowjobs video, it will probably help a bit more because I had more information than that. Sometimes I learn things and then just I, it leaves my brain, so I actually can't remember. Some of that I've never had an orgasm, and anytime I get close to it, I'm scared it'll be too much or that I'll pee. I actually am scared sometimes that I'll pee too. So it's just about letting yourself go. There's some sort of mental barrier there that you need to get past. You just re keep reassuring yourself that you're not going to piss. Okay, someone said watching porn together question mark. So watching porn together, I found this a great tool to communicate what you'd like in the bedroom without actually saying it. Especially if if it's coming from a girl's perspective, if you're in a heteronormative relationship, and try watching lesbian porn so that they're not like just watching what they're you know what they're doing to a man. Make sure that it's feminist ethical porn, obviously all of that. <laughs> yeah, you're like watching it together and you're like. I try not to have sex in the middle of it. Try watch the whole thing front to back and maybe give a bit of commentary. Small nice things to do for your partner. I really liked this question. So my love language is acts of service as well. So I love when Jason does things that I don't like doing like cleaning up after dinner or just doing things that I, that I would usually nag him to do but he does them without asking or every time he goes to the shop he gets me a treat or bringing me back a surprise from work. I love those little things. He used to leave post-its around the room when um, I was asleep and he'd go to work um, but I'm usually like awake before him now so he can't really do it but he'd leave them like above the bed like leave them on the lamp or leave them on the mirror so that I'd see them when I got up in the morning like I just do all his all those things for him anyway and that's not really his love language his love language is words of affirmation so the odd time I'm actually worse at it than he is I would like write him a really extensive love letter explaining how I'm feeling stuff that I've been keeping in and how much I love him, love him and why I love him. Another thing um, is really good is like organizing a whole date and then like bringing them on it rather than being like, should we go on a date? Just organize the whole thing and then bring them on it. I love bringing Jason on dates. It's like my favorite thing to do. I love being sugar mommy. It's my favorite. Being sugar mommy, like for some reason, it gets, it actually gets me off. I And sometimes I send him money for treats. Like I literally just transfer for him money for treats when he's in work at lunch. And I'm like, get yourself something nice, sweetie. Like what? I love it. I'm actually really bad at giving compliments. The only time I'm ever good at giving compliments is when I'm explaining Jason to, Jason to someone else. I'm so bad at giving them to him for some reason because I'm like, how do you not already know what you're like? It's really, like, it feels unnatural to me to give a compliment to someone because I assume that they already know that about themselves, especially if I'm with him uh, or going out with him. I just assume that he knows that, knows about what I like about him. But I have to make a more of a conscious effort and try to talk to him as if, I'm explaining him to someone else because when I'm talking to Ellie or Saoirse or one of my friends and what, how Jason is good in a relationship and why I'm so happy to be with him, it's so it comes so easy and naturally to me because obviously you want to hype up your partner to people and if you don't, there's probably something wrong if you don't want to hype them up. Now obviously I do do my fair share of bitching, don't get me wrong, venting, bitching, yeah, absolutely. You have to get it out sometimes but then you get over it. Like I let my friends vent and bitch and I don't go, maybe you should break up then at the end of it. That's bad friendship. That's bad friendship. You let them vent in your bitch, obviously, to a certain extent, if there's any signs of abuse or anything. 
but if it's just like oh they were being annoying and this is why blah 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 you don't go fucking break up with them then you know what i mean you have to let your friends vent get it out of their system and then because you know how much they love each other already so like sometimes it gets boring thinking i want to know what the the cracks are you know tell me and you can think of solutions together. Do you want me to listen or do you want me to give me a solution? Anyway. And then I put up another story asking for you to give me the best relationship advice you've heard. And I loved them so much. So I'm going to read out a few now. So someone said it's not always going to be 50-50. Ellie said the other day is that you're not always going to like the person that you're with. Especially now that I'm at a different stage probably to most people. I don't know if any like engaged people watch my videos. But I'm obviously thinking about a future with my partner. And like I'm going to be with, I want to be with them for the rest of my life. So we have to expect that sometimes it's going to go in waves where we don't really like each other or we don't being we, we don't like being around each other but we always love each other if obviously if it's prolonged it's going on for too long then sometimes you do have to break up unfortunately but hopefully not but the same thing is that it's not always going to be 50 50 like sometimes i'm going to love him more than he loves me or sometimes he's going to be going through a hard time so i have to put more effort into the relationship or vice versa. Another one is don't make long-term decisions on short-term feelings. I could be kind of reactive and impulsive as well. This is when I was like post-abusive relationship. Anytime something bad would happen, I'm like, let's break up because I'm just scared. I was terrified. Another one, someone said, ugly boys are mean, hot boys have less to prove and are so much nicer from experience. Now this, I would reword it. It's insecure boys because Obviously, if you're with someone, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, beauty is subjective. So if you're with them, you probably most likely think they're attractive anyway, so they're not really ugly. But to other people, they could be seen as ugly. Like, for example, I think that Jason is the hot, like, the hottest. I think he's so hot. I've never given so many, someone so many compliments on their looks before, and... I sometimes feel like I'm, sh I'm no better than a man. I'm so shallow and like something I actually can't keep. I can't hold in myself. Sometimes I'm like, you are so hot. But sometimes people might, other people might not see him the way, the same way that I do. But I personally think that he is so hot. <coughs> <coughs> But the good thing about him being hot is that he's also really secure in himself. So I don't have to worry about him ever treating me like shit because he's scared of me leaving him or I'm gonna have to psychoanalyze him every five minutes. Like, it's just very straightforward. Two confident people, two confident and secure people being together is a recipe for success. It's like the best thing, of, the best part I think about being in our relationship is we're both secure within ourselves separately and together in the relationship. And you know, obviously I go through stages because I'm preggers. I'm preggers, so I'm allowed. But it's just when my emotions take hold of me. It's not something to do with my um, security. I've been with an insecure boy before and he like literally was so mean to me. He was so, but he, it wasn't that he was so mean to me. It was like, he was incapable of loving me to the fullest extent of what I deserved. And I was constantly chasing after him and asking for, like begging for literally the bare minimum. I was like, don't, please don't text other girls. Like, oh my God, it was, it was pathetic. It was completely pathetic. And then even after we broke up, I was like begging for him to get back with me. And I thought that it was all me, like he doesn't love me enough, but it was literally just because he was insecure. I could have contributed to that. I could have been making him insecure. I'm not sure. A good thing to do is you do have to have a bit of self-reflection. I could have had an impact on his insecurities too during the relationship because I wasn't a fully healed person and I, I wasn't the best that I could have been for him. I've learned how to apologize and accept my faults too now from that relationship, but it was completely pathetic at how I how much I groveled for shite. It was not, it was a... Uh, yeah, it was not good. And now looking back on it, because I was very expressive during that time. I expressed a lot of emotions. I was very upset. And now sometimes when people bring it up to me, I'm like, yeah, I, I'm so thankful that I went through that though. Because now I'm able to learn that it was nothing to do with me. I'm, you know, and I can see how much I've grown since then. And I can see how much it's such a relief to not live like that in a relationship. Like constantly worrying about if they still like you or if they're going to leave you. They're looking for better options. Only with you for certain reasons. Oh, it's awful. It's awful. Ugh. It's literally, oh, it's horrible. But now I can look back at that person and be like, thank you for teaching me all of this. And thank you. 
Now, I don't know if they've changed or improved at all. Probably not, to be honest. I can't expect them to be on the like self-reflection, healing journey buzz. I can now look back at them and be like, thanks for all that you taught me. But I will ne thankfully never be experiencing this ever again. Someone said, you know what, what someone is really like by the way they treat those that don't matter to them. Again, I've had an ex who was really mean to people who we couldn't gain anything off of total turn off, red flag, and for some reason I thought it was like, they're protecting themselves, they're having boundaries with the public or like random people. I was like, but you can be polite, you don't have to be rude to people. There's a difference between like having boundaries and then actually just being a rude person. I prefer to be someone, to be with someone who is nice and kind and not trying to like exploit every single person that they meet and like, what can I get out of you, you know? Uh, it's better to fight sometimes than never. Conflict resolution teaches you about something. So true. I prefer to fight. I, I prefer to fight about it than to never speak about it at all. I love this one. It's me and you versus the problem, not me versus you. Very good. Next is showing emotion wouldn't put off someone who's emotionally available. Very true. And also, I, a big one is, no one said it, but learn to apologize. Learn to know when you're in the wrong. Okay, that's everything. I'm gonna leave the link for Beducated down below. If you use my link in the description, you get a free trial for 24 hours to use the whole website. So I really recommend trying out the Roadmap to Intimacy course, whether you're in a relationship or not. It's setting you up like you'll, it's good for even friendships too. It doesn't even have to be a romantic relationship. You could just not do the sexual part if you're in a platonic, for a platonic relationship. I would like to thank Beducated for sponsoring this video. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful. Just let me know what you thought about it. And I hope I didn't talk about myself too much and I gave actual good advice. So yeah, I'm sorry about my voice again, but I might, I don't know, I might sound a bit sexier with my voice like this, who knows. Okay, bye. I love you all so much. Bye.